My last talk was initially supposed to be devoted to the theorem on the existence of the classifying topos, which is exactly what Olivia if told you yesterday, and uh, that proof is, according to me, so technically heavy and boring that I decided not to impose you to listen to it a second time. It was done yesterday. So uh, I prepared uh, something else on the internal logic of a topos to tell you today. So, I have introduced elementary toposes. A major difference with Grothendieck toposes is that we only have finite limits and finite colimits. So you have the impression that the situation is definitely very poor because you cannot handle infinite processes. Let us go back to the dream of Bill Lovier when he invented toposes. He wanted to find an axiomatics of the category of sets and to base mathematics on an elementary topos, which would replace the category of sets. So if you take seriously this idea, you get rid of sets. You just work in your topos. Laurent, I've said many times, insisted very much, a topos is as good as the category of sets for a lot of things. So, if the natural context in which to develop our theory is that specific growth and dictopos, let us do it in this growth and dictopos. Yes, but then, if you do this in a growth and dictopos, why, my goodness, do you say I am in a growth and dictopos? I have a family of objects in this topos, can be infinite of what? A family of sheaves indexed by a set, possibly infinite. Why are you doing that? You say, my new world is my Grothendieck topos. That's the marvelous place where to develop my theory. No, but when I consider families, uh, I shall only take families indexed by set. You know, I shall not index my families by I shall not index my families by an object of the topos. No, 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 no. When I take a family, I still index it by something in sets. Uh, my golden dick topos is now my world, but uh, no, I do not want to index the things using the object of my topos. Why this restriction? Why don't you consider a family of sheaves indexed by sheaf? If your growth and dictopos is your new world, this is a sensible thing to do. In the category of sets, what are you doing? Okay, you have a set I with a lot of points. You take a family of sets AI, so you have AI, AI prime, and so on. And so you can view this as a big set. You can view this as something in the category of set, as a mapping in the category of set, where AI, well, is the inverse image of the element I. So here is an indexed family of sets, a family of sets indexed by I. And somehow you are not used to do this when you want to speak of a family of sets, but probably you have already done this in your life if you want in a topological context. You want to consider a family 
of continuous mappings on this and that, but which varies continuously along the points of a topological space. If A is a topological space, you would like also that passing from AI to AI prime occurs in some continuous way, and then you try to write down this continuity. So it is what we do uh, in a topos, including uh, an elementary topos, a I indexed family is just a mapping to I. Okay. Is that useful or not? Probably you are doubtful about that. A question was asked yesterday, and you answered the question, about explaining what a local is. You have to say for every family there must be a supremum. And you answered, no. You can just say, take a subset of the local, there is a supremum of this subset. Maybe we do not have in a topos unions and intersection indexed by sets. But we have all the unions and intersections induced, uh, indexed by the object of the topos. So, we have already seen various times that omega A uh, should be thought as an object of subobjects. of A. Take so omega. What is that? This is the object of Subobjects of Omega A. But a part of Omega A is intuitively a family of subobjects. So this is intuitively the object of families of subobjects. Of A. <coughs> there are two morphisms which I shall call union and intersection, <coughs> which give me the union and the intersection of the family of subobjects. This exists always in a topos. So, let me write P for such a family of subobjects. I, I, I use a variable P of type this. So intuitively, P, this variable, represents whatever family of subobjects of A. And I want to define this. It should be a subobject of A. I should give you a term of type A. This is the set of elements of A such that there exists an S, S 
is a variable of type omega a. There exists an S such that S belongs to P and uh, A belongs to S. That's a formula which is valid in the internal logic of a topos by what we have done. It describes, uh, it describes uh, an object of the topos. So in this way, I have defined a morphism in the topos which is the union of an arbitrary family of subobjects, but a family indexed in the topos, not indexed by a set. Yes? The meaning of belong. The meaning of belong uh, I asked for the meaning of belong. Of belong. What's not I introduced did not, in the previous. Did I forget to, to give belong in my formula? I, I, belong I think it so. is uh, among all the the arrows that we had. We, have, we had this, this mapping that we, we have seen before. Eh? So that uh, you apply uh, this arrow to, to the pair. And of course, the intersection will be defined in the same way, such for all S. S in P implies A in S. I can write this down in the internal logic of the topos. And then, of course, I have defined in this way two morphisms like that. <coughs> very special case, very special case, Take A equals 1. If you take A equals 1, you go from omega power omega to omega. It is what you can call the joint, the union in omega, the union of elements of omega. And this gives you the fact that in omega you have arbitrary joints defined internally. And so omega internally is a local. <coughs> it is complete. Every time you take a subset of omega, there is a join. That's the union. So you see, you recapture many things. And I think that uh, this approach, which you are forced to use in an elementary topos, because you don't have infinite limits and infinite colimits, so you must do this internally. But uh, this leads you to consider a lot of things which are, I think, quite interesting, including in the case of Grothendieck toposis, so we forget about that. Our Grothendieck topos is the world in which we are living. When you define a category, a small category, you see, I take a set of objects. I take sets of arrows. No, S please. Your world is now your Grothendieck topos. Why don't you take a sheaf of objects and a sheaf of morphisms? So, you are in a Grothendieck topos or you are in an elementary topos, it's the same. You take a sheaf which you call the, the sheaf of objects of your category. You take under the sheaf which you call the sheaf of arrows of your categories all arrows of the category. They are sheaves. You must have two morphisms of sheaves, which you call the domain and the codomain of the arrow. An arrow goes from one object to another one. So the arrows should be mapped on objects. 
and every object should give rise to an identity. Now, you take the pair of arrows such that the codomain of the first one is the domain of the next one, so you take the pullback of those two things, so you get the sheaf of composable arrows, and if you have the sheaf of composable arrows, you want to have a composition. And you write down all the axioms that you are used to, to have in the case of a category. And you have now a category which has a sheaf of objects and a sheaf of arrows. Yes? Just a little doubt about uh, your use of sets. All the time you speak about sets. But uh, are you speaking about a standard model of JFC, the Merlo Frankel choice? Because. Well, I, I, I would rather say I don't care. You don't care? No. Okay. <laughs> My idea is not to speak about sets. So. Uh, so, you have this. So, that's what you can call a category C defined in your world of the topos. And then you can want to define a functor from the category C, for example, to the topos. What is a functor? Well, a functor, well, for every C, you should have a sheaf F of C. So you should have a family of sheaves, f of c, indexed by c, oh yes, but c, Ooh, a family of sheaves indexed by all the objects, but the object has themselves a sheaf. So you want to, to have something indexed by the object, so a functor, well, a functor will be a sheaf, like that, over objects which you think, eh? The fiber over the object is, the object C is F of C. And you write down the axioms, and you get, of course, a situation with, which is much richer than what you would do if you stay at the, the set level. Including in a growth and dictopos, it is something much richer to consider categories which have a sheaf of objects and a sheaf of arrows, not just a set of objects and a set of arrows. But this construction works perfectly well in an elementary topos. Yes? Um, if it wouldn't take too long, how do you get the um, a map between the fibers of this family? Um, where so as a functor you would have for yes, every you C you have, have FC to uh, as a functor you mm. must have an action of the arrow. This sheaf has to act on this one. Okay. You have an action of the set of arrows on the on the set here. And, uh, okay. okay. We can discuss this after the talk, if you want. So, you see, that's the first point I wanted to make. Indeed, in an elementary topos, you do not have infinite things indexed by sets, but you can always index things by objects of the topos. And when you go to the case of a Groton dictopos, you see that indexing by a sheaf instead of a set puts you in a much richer situation. So it was an observation, I think, which was useful to be made in order to <coughs> grasp a little bit what the idea of infinity is in an elementary topos, well, uh, you no longer speak of infinity, you speak at all the of all the levels which live inside the topos. 
But I have told you that in a topos, like in the theory of sets, you can introduce an axiom of infinity, an additional axiom, which is say, which says that x, x is infinite when there exists an isomorphism sigma from x plus 1 to x. <coughs> axiom. There exists an infinite object. In the topos. So you add this to the axioms for an elementary topos. This axiom is obviously satisfied for Groton Dick toposes. For Groton Dick toposes, simply take the sum of one indexed by the natural number, one plus one plus one plus one plus one infinitely many times. If you had one copy of one, this doesn't change anything. Now you have all the one plus one plus one plus one plus one, or you had one copy, well, you easily describe an isomorphism just by re-indexing the things. So in a Groton Dictopos, certainly there is an object like that. If you have this in the topos, you can define the object of natural numbers in the topos. What is it? Well, look, here you have the inclusion of one in the coproduct, which you can compose with that, this gives you a composite. Let me call it x0. It's a composite of the injection in the coproduct and the isomorphism sigma. The idea to construct the natural numbers is to say, I take x0. I have here sigma, but x0 is here. I take sigma of x0. I get sigma of x0, which is there, but it is here. So I take sigma of sigma of x0, and I keep going on. Eventually, I should have as many elements as there are natural numbers. This is the intersection of all the S. S is of type omega x. S is a variable which represents a subset of x. I take the intersection of all the subsets of x such that x0 is in S. And when x is in S, then sigma of x is in S. I look at all the subsets which contain x0, and when they contain an element, they contain the next one. Yes. <laughs> And I take the intersection of all of them. This is the, the object of natural numbers in the topos. And a little bit of work shows that in every elementary topos, the object that you have constructed in this way 
satisfies all the piano axioms for arithmetic. So if you have an infinite object in a topos, you can develop arithmetic in a topos uh, because you have an object which satisfies all the axioms in the internal logic of the topos, all the piano axioms for arithmetic are satisfied. This is about the axiom of infinity. Now, another axiom which has been already mentioned several times is Booleanity. So, we have seen that if we have a formula phi, not not phi, implies phi, is not valid, Laurent told me that I was no longer allowed to use the black, the, the red pencil, so I shall do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is not valid. Well, of course, what is always valid is that. Proving that it is valid is proving that it is bigger than true. So this is proving that true and phi is smaller than not, not phi, which is Not phi implies false. So you must prove that phi is smaller than not phi implies false. So by Cartesian adjunction again, you must prove that phi and not phi is smaller than false. Yes, phi and not phi is false. So you always have this implication. Generally, you do not have the other implication. The topos is said to be Boolean when phi is equivalent to not not phi. That's the definition of a Boolean topos. And of course, if you go to Boolean topos, you recapture a logic which is already much closer to classical logic than the intuitionistic logic of a general topos. There are still some differences. So, an example of a Boolean topos, of course, you take a local L, which is a complete Boolean algebra. In a Boolean algebra, A and B is smaller than C, if and only if A is smaller than uh, that is B A, B, C, A and B is contained in C when A is contained in the complement of B join C. So, this is B implies C. In a Boolean algebra, you have an implication. A Boolean algebra is a local. The implication is a complement join. So, uh, you can take the, the sheaves on the complete Boolean algebra 
And it turns out that's very easy to check that the sheaf on a Boolean algebra, just because uh, omega, the omega, which is constructed by the down segments of L, omega is a Boolean algebra, and so the, the subobjects of every object will be will give you a Boolean algebra because the subobjects of every object, the subobjects of every object, are given by the morphisms to omega. Uh, omega is a Boolean algebra at each level, because I start from a Boolean algebra. So I have a Boolean algebra structure on the phi, so I have a Boolean algebra structure on the subsets, uh, on the subsets of subobjects, are they sets or not? It's not my point. So these are the Boolean toposes. Are there many? Boolean toposes. Yes. I would rather say there are as many Boolean toposes as toposes. Take a topos, whatever topos, locally, Grotendieck elementary, it doesn't matter. You have this logical connector on omega. This you have on omega, that. Double negation. This is a topology. I have told you what the topology on omega is. It's a morphism J on omega, which makes commutative three diagrams. And in the case of a Grothendieck topos, those topologies coincide, well, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the Grothendieck topologies. So this is a topology. So there is a topos of sheaves, a subtopos of sheaves for this double negation topology. And this topos is always Boolean. Always. So that's why I am saying that there are as many Boolean toposes as toposes, because every time you have a topos, it has a Boolean subtopos. Now you can ask the question, When is a Grothendieck topos Boolean? Answer, if and only if it is the sheaves on B with B, a complete Boolean algebra. So this means, in particular, that for a Grothendieck topos to be Boolean, it has to be localic. It has to be the topos of sheaves on a local, a local, which is a Boolean algebra. There is, in the logic of a topos, a last axiom which I would like to mention. An, axi an axiom that one doesn't like at all to use in elementary topos theory, because it goes somehow against the spirit of, uh, of elementary toposes. This is the axiom of choice. Uh, sorry, uh, but uh, um, any atomic topos uh, is uh, Boolean. Uh, yeah. No, I mean any atomic topos is Boolean. So there are uh, non local atomic toposes. A Grothendieck topos? Yes. Are you sure? Did I make a mistake? Uh, 
Well, uh, I will talk about atomic toposes later in my course. And, uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, <laughs> okay, maybe uh, you know this better than I do. Uh, I was yeah, for sure, if uh, the topos is localic, then yeah. uh, it should be a complete Boolean algebra. This is sure, but uh, there are many others. And you think so? Ah, yes, I am pretty sure. Okay, okay. Yeah. then I believe you, then I made a mistake. Uh, there is the axiom of choice. What does the axiom of choice classically say? It says, take a family of sets, non-empty sets. Then you can pick up an element AI in each AI. You can make a choice of an element in each AI. What is a family of sets? A family of sets, as we have seen, is just a mapping like that. Saying that every set is non-empty is saying that there is something over each i. So it is saying that it is a surjection. Picking an element in each fiber is just picking a section. So the axiom of choice is every epi as a section. It's a very, very strong property. And uh, this implies always that the topos is Boolean. If the axiom of choice is valid, necessarily the topos is Boolean. Okay, I shall stop there. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Uh, so thank you very much for your beautiful lectures. Uh, just a short remark, namely, uh, um, so you introduced the universal and the existential quantifier, yeah. but only for quantifying over the elements of some object of the topos. Yes. There are some situations where we would like to have unbounded quantification. For instance, when we want to express universal properties, like saying for any group it holds that and um, so one can extend the language you presented with unbounded quantifiers. And uh, one can read about this in a beautiful paper by Mike Schulman called uh, The Stack Semantics and Comparison of Material Set Theories. Okay. And then you can develop like all of... Mm. Uh, it also adds a dependent type theory to that, and then you can interpret like all of constructive mathematics, even using unbounded quantification internal to our topos. So I think um, you just answered my question, but I, I will ask it maybe without using stack semantics. Uh, you described an internal functor um, from an internal category to the topos you're in. I'm wondering then, can you prove that every elementary topos is complete and co-complete relative to those categories? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. yes. Oh, yes. An elementary topos is complete and co-complete with respect to all the internal categories and functors. Yeah, oh, yes. Every yes. elementary topos thinks oh, it is a Grothian oh, topos. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes, it is. There is no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah.
but uh, when you have not uh, set, what is the set of objects and uh, what is the... Uh, you, you say, I have an elementary topos, yeah. I have objects and I have arrows, where are these uh, guys uh, live? They are an object of the topos. <laughs> I have an elementary topos, I take an object of the topos, which is the object of objects. <laughs> I take an object of the topos. Well, if you think of a Grotenweg topos, if it is easier for you, uh, if you think uh, of a Grotenweg topos, I just say, I take an object O of the Grotenweg topos. I take a sheath of objects. I take a sheath of morphisms. So, but uh, this is a bit of a... No, it, it works, it works. Right. Yes. So, uh, what is the basis of the construction of an uh, elementary topos? What is we, the basis? The, for example, for Grotendik topos, the basis is satori. Uh, no, it's not satori uh, at all. I, I uh, when you have a Grotendik topos, you, you say I have a category, a category is defined in satori. Uh, here, we, when you have an elementary topos, what is the basis? of your constructions? The, the basis is my, is, is my elementary topos. So. <laughs> uh, well, an elementary topos is choosing objects and choosing arrows so you have without any set condition. Yeah, you have a composition, you have identities, and then you have some axioms. So you use a naive set theory. I think so. The that I use a naive set so. theory. Uh, you mean I don't know if I am using naive set theory. I, uh, I am saying that I have a terminal object, that I have A product B, that I have the equalizers of two arrows, I express the Cartesian closedness, I express the existence of a subobject classifier. I, I do not see why I should need uh, a set theory for that. Nice. Well, maybe. I don't know. When you define a category and you do not say anything about the class of, ob about the class of objects, what set theory are you using to say I take the object of the category? I do exactly the same thing for the object and for the arrows. Uh, I, if you accept doing that for the objects, why don't you accept to do it for the arrows? So in. in in logic nowadays, a set is just a symbol on the whiteboard that respects some, some axioms. It, it doesn't, if I ask you the question, what's a set, you don't have an answer. It's just something that respects some axioms. You can do the same with category theory. In this sense, you can build mathematics on category theory, ignoring set theory. This is the sense in which it means. Because if I ask you the question, what's a set, you don't, you don't really have an answer. It's, it's a formal writing that respects some axioms, which are the axiom of ZFC. Uh, the axiomatic system of ZFC is a study of a certain uh, primitive recursive uh, function from N to N. This is not set theory. Set theory is a bigger thing. It is not the formalization of set theory. 
formalized systems are very poor. Hmm? So when you identify satellite with ZFC, you make a counter, comment dire, contrasens? It is completely contrary to the intuition. The formal system is nice, but it is not satellite. I think we all we work with the naive sector. Uh, perhaps we, we don't agree with the naive sector, but we work naively with natural numbers. For example, in the ZFC or in the topos, it is impossible to prove that there are not uh, infinite, infinite uh, elements in, in natural numbers. So I, I, I would, uh, everybody thinks uh, as natural numbers are finished after uh, you had uh, all uh, naive natural numbers. But this is not expressed in the DFC in the piano. It is not expressed. Yes, but if you take natural numbers in the Groton Dick Topos, it is not just zero, one, two, three, four. There are many other natural numbers than one, two, three, four in a, in a Groton Dick Topos. You know? Many, many other ones. The object that the object of natural numbers, yes, it contains the ordinary natural numbers. But there is much more in that. Uh, I just want to come back a minute. You are completely right, Olivia. I just mixed up two things about my Grotendieck topos. Uh, the Grotendieck topos satisfies the axiom of choice. if and only if it is sheaves on a complete Boolean algebra. <laughs> and uh, indeed, uh, the, and then it is Boolean. And then for a local ectopos, uh, of course, a local ectopos, Boolean is equivalent to sheaves on a complete Boolean algebra. I, I mix it, the, the, two, the two results. But you know, I prepared my talk yesterday night and at the very <laughs> end. <laughs> uh, okay. I mix it two things which were present in my mind. And <laughs> that's the correct result, you are right.